What I'm going to do is uh, talk to you about, it's a, if you like, it's a case study of the Canterbury Health System. And what it, uh, let's just, yes. What it also, there's a great Maori phrase, which is, what is the most important thing in the world? He ata meo nui o te aho. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is people, it is people, it is always people. And we should hopefully, we'll have some fun and games with this, by the way. Uh, in order for the whole system to be working, we actually have to have the whole system needs to work. And what I'm going to talk to you about is a health system that is now in the top five health systems in the world, along with Jönköping County in uh, Sweden, uh, the Kaiser Permanente, which um, uh, somebody talked about, was that you yesterday? Heather spoke about uh, Kaiser Permanente in America, uh, Intermountain Health also in the United States, and Salford NHS Trust in the northwest of England. So it's right up there uh, with that. We really are going to have some fun with this. There we go. So this is a story of how 18,000 people transformed the health system in Canterbury. First of all, a bit about who, uh, where, who or what Canterbury are. It's one of 20 district health boards in the country, and uh, as well as the uh, Canterbury District Health Board, you can see it there, it also covers the West Coast, which uh, I'm trying to think of the geographical equivalent in New Zealand, but it would be Newcastle to Cornwall on the west coast of New Zealand, but it's only got a, so I don't know how many hundred kilometres that would be, but it only has 30,000 people living in it. It's got a, a, uh, a budget of, of uh, 1.4 billion New Zealand dollars and about a half a million of a population. And as well as the funded workforce, it's got a supported workforce, as, as well as the employed workforce, of another 9,000. So running to uh, around 18,000 plus people. And the context is this. This was the Canterbury Health System. I would like to think it will be. Um, Jason, would it be possible to raise the computer uh, to a higher level so it should be able to pick up the um, it should be able to pick up the, the signal off this thing if you don't mind please in the uh, the beginnings of this system was that it looked like this a very fragmented system it's 2007 and it was in a, in a quite well, this won't be a, an entirely unfamiliar kind of image to you and what you had was, if we were going from 2007 to 2020 at the trajectory of growth, we would have needed another hospital the size of Christchurch, would be about 550 beds, we'd need another one of its same size. We would also have needed another 20% more GPs by 2020, and we would have not needed another 2,000 care home beds, acute care facility, aged care facility beds by 2020. The other big challenge they had was about a scarce and aging workforce. It took them quite a long time for them to paint that picture of me. <laughs> and the biggest global crisis in, in, in healthcare is not a financial one, although there seems to be a preoccupation with deficit. And you'll never fix a deficit by focusing on the deficit. The, it's not a buildings one. The greatest global crisis in healthcare is one of people. And, and we saw that from Karen's really great presentation this morning. So really what had to, something just had to change. So what we've done, we created, was a, is a vision with acknowledgement, due acknowledgement to Redbridge Primary Care Trust in England. And what you'll see in here is a connected system that is centered around people. And this image, this woman here, is a, a, a composite uh, person known as Agnes. And Agnes is a woman who, who's an aged uh, woman in her own, in her own home. She's mul multiple complex comorbidities. And what she wants to do is she wants to stay at home. But as well as a connected system centered around people, it is also one that aims not to waste their time. Because the most important currency in healthcare is patient time. But in order to value patient time, we also have to value staff time as well. So that was the context. And the way we started to look at was we had to start with this. It starts. It ends it, with trust. And that was about trusting clinicians and creating care pathways that are redesigned, that the funding that is, uh, that is uh, um, rearranged to support best practice. Let's hope this doesn't fall over. Here we go. Putting the patient in the middle and having a system that responds well to shocks and an adaptive leadership style, so one that is not fixed to an ideology but is flexible. 
and the three strategic goals of the Canterbury Health System, and I probably ought to say at this point, we don't tend to talk about Canterbury Health Board, um, we tend to talk about Canterbury Health System. And talking to Tracy earlier today, we tend to have very agnostic view about where the people are providing uh, service delivery. So we work with NGOs, with private sector, with public sector, because at the end of the day, the patients don't really get that bothered where it is. What they do get bothered is what's the quality of the care will be. That's what matters a great deal more, and a connected system that talks to each other to itself. And goals that are about the patients of people taking greater responsibility for their own health. You know, health care in an acute hospital is a tiny fraction of health care. Depending on the literature you look at, between 85 and 95 percent of, of health care is self-care. Enabling people to stay well in their own homes and in their own communities. And then the third one is people receiving timely and appropriate care, complex care where it's needed. And that does not necessarily mean in a hospital. You, the word hospital doesn't feature in this at all. So that means com complex care being delivered in, in homes and in community settings that meet their needs. And those goals have not changed because this is what it's about. Hosp healthcare is not about hospitals. What they are about is resilient systems. Funny enough, I gave this presentation, a variant of this, at the Chief Nursing Officers Conference a Summit in December in England. And this picture was the one that went around Twitter the most. This is the, the context, if you look, this is the, some of the narrative around it. And, and in order to get something to change, what you have to do is get a coalition of the willing. And what that involved was getting 80 thought leaders in our system. And what they did, go back one, what they were was uh, clinicians, managers, consumers, Maori Health and others. And then we invited in people from the, the bottom left there, the Treasury, to see what's the demographic profile of, of Canterbury and, and New Zealand going to be like over the next 50, 60 years. Somebody that came in from the local bus company, because they are surprisingly like health. Seasonal variation, uncapped demand, they need to deliver services in a timely fashion. And actually, generally, do so really, really well. Um, it's beautiful to see in London overnight, a son of a bus driver has been elected as the first Muslim mayor of London. And that's, that's a really, really great thing to see, that anyone can do this. Um, I, I suspect that Donald Trump will now be building a wall around England and London. <laughs> Uh, having, um, having like, you know, providers like uh, going out to see Air New Zealand, the logistics. If you think about the massive growth in aviation, it's much greater in passenger numbers than the growth in healthcare, and yet they do it really, really well. By the way, just so another remember, somebody asked me earlier, if anyone's going to the, the um, uh, this is me slipping back into MC thing over here for a second, anyone going to the, um, the, the plane station, you know the, you know the one that's the, uh, the shopping centre with an airport attached? Uh, anyone who's going, if you just meet downstairs and you'll just talk to each other, you just say, share a taxi, you save yourself some money. Okay, now I'm back here again. <laughs> so that was the context, and what it was really about was creating a social movement. So you get 80 people who are committed, they've got the strategic goals, they know what the vision is, what they want to achieve. Now how do you persuade, go from 80 to whole system? And what we did is we created a showcase. And the showcase was in a, a warehouse, which actually would be about this size looking at it, and we invited people on, the deal was they could only invite, they would, each of the 80 would invite 10 people. No big emails, no Facebook campaign, nothing like that, it's just all word of mouth. And they came to, the, uh, to this warehouse and they were invited in and when they first came in, there was a room which had had you know, pictures of the old hospitals, the old GP practices, the, the health system of, of the past. And there was also, do you remember the 1970s suitcases? Now, if you can go back from the 80s, see if you can get back further. And what are some of these on suitcases we saw on holiday were, were slogans like, we're not funded for that, and that's not my job, or the government will bail us out. And what it was was, here's all the myths that exist that we need to take on. And when they were given a, a they were then given a cookie, a, you know, Chinese um, fortune cookie. They opened it up, and one of those suitcases was opened, and they had to throw them into the baggage, and leave the baggage behind as they went on the journey into a future health system. 
And part of that space were, it was an experiential learning, some of it was like, what would it be like if we carry on? Or what would it be like if you go into a room where Agnes is talking to a nurse practitioner or a practice nurse on a Skype consultation, bear in mind it's 2009, Skype consultation and getting her healthcare without having to move out of the house. So what are the potential opportunities? Uh, if you look on the, the middle right one here, you can see where this was to do with uh, people getting um, skin lesions removed. And all of the bottlenecks and constraints that would happen, they'd go to an appointment, they'd come back for an appointment, they'd go for another appointment, they'd have to get some bloods. And then really frustrating, so we put stop signs all the way. And as you can imagine, staff, family, you know, staff and, and the public were getting very frustrated by this. And what it was about is saying, this is a patient's journey. How do we go about fixing it? We thought we'd get about 800 people. That was the kind of goal to come through this. We had well in excess of 2,500 people came through that who got the messages, who got the understanding, got the language that emerged from it. We launched a whole series of initiatives. Improving the patient journey was one I was brought into Canterbury for initially back in 2005. I was only supposed to be there for five weeks, Irish five weeks. Um, you know, that was around acute stuff, looking at uh, the Canterbury Initiative, I'll talk more about health services, planning, and a whole range of other things. Because there isn't one magic bullet, it's about a whole range of opportunities. Investing in education, and it is one of the things when there's a financial constraint, that education is often a soft underbelly of funding. And we took a judgment call to invest heavily in education because what Accelerate was about was about leadership of the system leaders. Uh, or, or the education of them, so that they would get together groups of 16, uh, senior nurses, managers, allied health, and so on, obviously doctors as well, talking about lean, patient safety, a whole range of things. And at the end of that, they would have an opportunity, four teams of four, to pitch in a dragon's den to the CEO, David, about what they wanted to change. And at the end of it, and there's some brilliant stuff, it saved many, many millions, but the goal really was about creating a climate and a culture where people understood change and would do it. And they were given a permission card. This one says, you have my permission to change our health system in Canterbury, and signed David Mates. Now, you know, when we first came out, it kind of felt a little bit hokey, but people absolutely loved them, because symbolically, it's very powerful to see CEO signed to say you can go and change stuff. The program I run is called Collaborate. It's a two-day program open to absolutely everyone. And uh, not, very, not very long ago, I had a nurse, a doctor, an IT person, a cook from Rangi or a hospital. Um, and there was an example of a, a retail pharmacist worked with a, a nurse manager from a, a age residential care center working on medicines reconciliation. So creating a thousand stories of change. The Canterbury Initiative is about the health professions working together to improve the health system together. Health pathways is something over 700, actually knocking on 800 now, and that covers as well as uh, New Zealand, it's also covering Australia and parts of England and Alaska, and as health professionals working together. So you will have, for example, general practitioners working alongside orthopedic surgeons. Who knew? You could see the white smoke coming out. They thought there was, a, you know, a papal, uh, you know, the Pope had been elected. But actually, the thing is, hospital clinicians didn't know the workload of GPs and vice versa. And everyone was whinging over the wall at each other. And when they sat down together, they realized that maybe we should work in unison to say that the referrals, like patients with back pain, let's create a referral pathway that you don't waste the patient's time but also when you do refer them, they don't wait for as long to be seen. Uh, it's all visible, they're never more than two clicks away from a solution. And we have a, uh, I'll go back to this very briefly, but uh, what they also have is health info, so all this information is also available to the public in uh, general public language as well. So when they see a patient about, say, their prostate, then they have a richer understanding of what that, what that involves. Uh, education is training and development. We started alliancing, we learned this from the European um, building trade, because what you don't get is people who have developed um, building. Um, you carry on, it's okay. Nobody noticed. You're fine. <laughs> the, <laughs> I, I do like your limbo skills. You know, <laughs> so it's all good. So that way, we all continuously working together in concert, and that's a much better way of working. So it's equal relationships. The way it works is this: we have very high trust, and we've got very low bureaucracy. 
I worked with a nurse manager in I think New South Wales. He had 18 steps just to recruit a number, a member, a different person. Or something. I mean, and he says like snakes and ladders. If one person doesn't sign, it comes all the way back. We treat it as one health system and one budget. It's one health system, one budget, and it's what's best for the patient and what's best for the system. And then everyone wins and everyone loses. It's about equity and equality and what is fair. And what we've got here, as you can see, is all of the different organizations working in concert, in alignment, together. And it's chaired by a high court judge. That's really helpful. Uh, multi -D, uh, sorry, multidisciplinary education available to everyone as well, which is very, very important. So integrated care should be seamless. You know, it should be about a system that works together the skills of the practitioners and from different places in order to make it better to work in partnership. It's about trusting. I keep talking about trust, but actually it's very important. Nurses, doctors, allied health professionals are hard-working women and men who want to come to work to do a good job and actually quite rightly resent when they're being not, not being trusted. It is not fair, it is not right. And for the odd outlier who misbehaves and, and rorts the system, there are many, many more who will do the right thing. And so we work on a basis of trust. Enabling frameworks so you have incentives is not about the money. Money's always there, but actually we've taken money off the table because money is simply a distraction. And we don't put in incentives. I really just like this euphemistic term, we lose incentives. Because what we're saying is we bribe people to do their job, and the healthcare record's a good example of that. And as nurses, actually, we have a collective responsibility to get into that space as well. Does it work? Yes, we manage costs, we deliver outcomes, we've got pathways, got a whole range of things. So it actually is, it's working really quite well. It's very much about we, not they. We have all these various acute demand services I won't go into, but you'll be familiar with many of them. And has it worked? Well, 2007, the place was a basket case. It had a $30 million deficit. We were staring down massive waiting lists. We had demand that was growing out of control. Within a few years, we had saved on just four conditions. That is um, uh, heavy menstrual bleeding, um, uh, skin lesions, uh, acutely unwell in hospital, and the fourth escapes me right now. One and a half million days of Cantabrian's time no longer wasted. Put that in a different way, that is 4,100 life years not wasted in waiting. So it was going in the right direction. The thing is, if you want to make God laugh, tell him you have a plan. And lunchtime on the 22nd of February, we had an enormous earthquake. There had been a 7.1 on February, the, September the 4th, 2010, and this one hit at 12.51 lunchtime, and it wasn't very far away from the city center of Christchurch. Have a look, if you will, at this. New Zealand's darkest day. At least 65 people are dead, many more injured. The magnitude 6.3 quake struck in the heart of the city of Christchurch. Pulling a body um, out of rubble um, that had fallen on a car. People with blood pouring down their faces, just, just walking in a daze. No one can be alive under this. Emergency services urged people to get out of the city. So it's just huge, it is huge. Um, you can just see the, the buildings that have lost their facade. Australia's offer of emergency help has been and taken the danger up is far the New Zealand from government over. comes yeah. to grips with the scale of the Just tremble again and, and then just panics everyone and, and, uh, and, and then they, they get hit for, uh, for the outskirts of the town, really.
Um, I even now don't like looking at that, I must be honest. And actually that footage is from three years ago and it's still a very, very broken city. 80% of the CBD has been demolished. 25% um, of our staff had damaged homes and there's a phrase that's come in, nobody ever uses the phrase, by the way, ever anymore, safe as houses. Don't hear that. Um, but also that, you know, you, you know, there's a phrase called, you know you're from Christchurch when? And in my case, it's you know you're from Christchurch when? You've only had $50,000 of, of damage to your place. Uh, you're only out of your place for four months, you know. Uh, it's a significant amount of damage. The roads and infrastructure was completely wrecked. Uh, right now, they're still spending a million dollars a day on um, roads and infrastructure. Buildings uh, collapsed. That's the, the PGD building. The, uh, most people died in the CTV building. CTV building was uh, where 115 people lost their lives, including a private GP practice. This is the Catholic Cathedral. And 185 people died uh, that day, and 6,659 people were injured. They were coming into the hospital on, in cars, on the back of utes, on surfboards and ironing boards, um, in, in all kinds of ways, as quickly as possible. The first person arrived, she was a four-year-old, arrived within four minutes of the quake uh, in the center of town, carried in by an off-duty paramedic. This is a view from the east, looking to the east of the city. The east of the city uh, dropped by 1.5 meters. This is a really significant seismic event. And if you look here, uh, just there over here in the middle of, uh, just inside Hagley Park, that's where the, the hospital is. So really it was right by the, the center of it. It's unusual for the hospital, but in fact it was also part of the uh, major disaster uh, space. This is looking west. The Port Hills, which you see to your top left, they shifted by 40 centimeters. So there was very, it was also 2.2 G um, uh, ground acceleration. What that means is that the, the, the buildings were being lifted up, and as they were dropping, the ground was lifting up underneath them, and of course it was smashing the buildings from, from underneath. The emergency departments, were, because of the earthquakes, there was 99 aftershocks on the day of the Feb quake alone, and they, because the generators were being shaken so much, you know, external power was gone, um, it was shaking the dirt into the jennies, which meant that the lights were kept going off. And as somebody rightly said, it's really, really hard to put in a vent flan into somebody's arm through using a torch in your mouth. And also, people didn't know, people at work did not know how safe the integrity of the building was, and nobody left, not one. There was a woman, a uh, nurse manager I know in the ED, her son was 150 meters away at Christ's school. That building had been damaged. She didn't know if her son was alive. Nobody walked away. That's uh, pretty hard to get your records when that's the state of your records department. And uh, we lost people, our people lost people. And the system was hit really, really hard. We lost 105 acute inpatient beds. They were mainly the medical wards, the four medical wards, and people were having to be carried down the stairs, uh, usually in the dark by you know, the medical students, the orderlies, and so on. Um, often, on, uh, many of them had a, a dense uh, stroke, so they were being carried on, on mattresses. We lost 635 age residential care beds, 12 pharmacies, a GP practice was lost. And that one was in the CTV building, uh, a GP, some psychologists, a number of nurses were killed. There were some student nurses who were doing their training to get onto the New Zealand register. There were Filipino, Japanese, Indian nurses, and a number of those were killed in that, uh, in that building. Out of the 16, 17,000 hospital rooms around the whole system, around 14,000 of them were damaged. So it dealt the system, oh, by the way, I had a quick look on a thing called Christchurch Quake Map, and since the September quake, there's been 14,458 aftershocks. Uh, there was a, what was it, 2.8 this morning at about 10 to 9 hour time. It's stuff you get used to. So we lost people, our people lost people. We didn't lose the system, and that's what's important, because we had a plan. We had a plan to keep it going, to keep it, because our system was built on trust and good relationship, and you do the hard work in the good times, it pays its dividends in the hard times. 
So we had resilience and within hours we were up and running and what we did is we threw the energy into primary care because that's the smartest place to invest, to trust, to put your energy is into primary care, offering free uh, care to people in the communities for quite some time and that's because we had a connected system. Now I don't want to paint a completely bleak picture because actually for most people it was one of the best times of their lives counterintuitively. You'll find that of stories of the Second World War as where people felt in one strange way even more alive than ever and looked out for each other and people got to know their neighbours because if you're digging a latrine in your place and they haven't got a place to do it, you know, you get to know people quite well. And you know you from Christchurch when you've got three people standing in, beside you in your doorway during an aftershock and you don't feel it's an invasion of your personal space. Um, I remember lying on, in bed one night, it was a good old aftershock, it must have been about a five, and the bed was rocking away and I was thinking, Jesus, people pay good money for this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of all we have a choice of attitude and our attitude in life determines our direction of travel uh, of our spirit. And uh, the ED docs decided they wanted a new toy, so they stole an uh, enamored personnel carrier. And we set up a, a, a message of support, and there was support, and, and I'll tell you now, the Aussies had their boots on the ground first. I was in the, the logistics bit, and uh, the Osmat team, the Australian Medical Agency aid team, came over from, from uh, Queensland. Paramedics, nurses, doctors from Mackay, from Brizzy, from uh, Gold Coast and other places. Absolutely sensational. They were billeted in the rugby club, and I tell you now, they all went back several kilos late, light, um, heavier because all the Kiwis were feeding them cakes and muffins and all sorts. Now, there was a lot of love. It's the first time the police services of Australia from all the ter states and territories worked together on one mission. They were giving a great big hacker. Um, there was a lot of love. So there was one person said it was kind of a bit odd as a Kiwi because it felt like your big sister was coming over to give you a kiss and you're the little brother and it just felt a bit weird, but it was all right. Now, the good news is normal hostilities had been resumed by September for the World <laughs> Cup. The other thing is, we had, like say, support and love from a lot of countries, and, and this is my favourite. It was a school in Oregon, Joseph, Oregon, and all these kids wrote letters to us. And here's the, this is my favourite, this was everyone's favourite. Dear doctors and nurses, hello, my name is Jake. I'm 11 years old. I live in Joseph, Oregon. I'm really sorry about the earthquake. Anyways, good luck, luck taking care of everyone. I really do hope you take care. Remember, help the person that is the person that people that are severely injured first. Try not to mention the people are going to die. Then it'll get chaotic with depression. From Jake. <laughs> P.S. I love animals. <laughs> How gorgeous is that? Our student nurses that year, there was a 100% pass rate. They set, up, they, they set up a Facebook student army where they would go into nursing homes and say, look, we're our, our school of nurses, right? We will help you. We will just do our bit. It was an extraordinary time of extraordinary people. Since then, we've done another showcase. I, the, where I work is in a place called the Design Lab, a big, big warehouse, 3,000 square feet warehouse, where we're mocking up designs of what our future system, health system, hospitals, a, a, um, health facilities will look like. Um, we've been redesigning what the beds will look like, what the wards will look like, a 21st century Nightingale ward. The bedhead, nobody's ever looked at that for the last 100 years, and we've designed it, we've put a panel over it, which will reduce the sound, because a lot of people are old people, and reduces the noise around them. Uh, we have applied a lot of new technology. So we use a thing called Health One. Um, what that means is you've got a shared care record viewer so you can see when a patient goes to the emergency department you can see their GP records, so can St. John Ambulance, so can the district nurses and now the private sector are doing the same thing. It's an agnostic system but it means there's visibility. The whole thing with the clinical record, I can look at my records and have been able to for years. We've just worked on the assumption everyone wants it, very few people opt out. No incentives given to anyone, just get on with it and it's done. The, we have a snapshot usage that's very, very highly used. We've got a, a, a South Island-wide uh, patient information system, so if somebody comes from Dunedin, you can see what's going on with them. We lose a lot of data because we want to have evidence of what we're doing. There's no point doing data which shows you what happened in the rear view mirror. We can project outwards of where we want to be. Don't ask me what the cat was doing there, I have no idea. <laughs> Key programs, uh, falls prevention, I really love this. This is driven by clinicians, community falls champions, go to their homes and see, look at the mats. Help them to learn to stand up and sit down, just to build quadricep muscle mass, doing Tai Chi. 
I, this, is, this is gorgeous. It means there's fewer falls, fewer older people come to ED with falls. They have fewer admissions. They've got fewer bed days following a fractured neck of femur, and fewer people die as a consequence. We have uh, acute demand management where we're just preventing people from coming in. It's driven largely by GPs now and community teams to stop them coming in. Community re-enablement means that they get six weeks of support when they go home, which again means that you're managing with greater acuity, but what you are doing is supporting people to come in, from, uh, to come in at all. Having, how does it compare? Well, this is the numbers. The blue one is, is Canterbury and our, um, we're managing a lot more uh, elective activity, we're reducing waiting times. We're reducing how long people wait. It's not just the high, lowest admission rate, it's also got the lowest readmission rate in the country. So what does it mean? Well, what it means is this. It means that people stay well and self-manage in their own homes and in their own communities. And, then, and the flat lines in the hospital, I do think I worry about this language of tsunami of old age coming, because actually that implies we don't gonna do, aren't going to do very much. If you change the inputs, you can have amazing outputs that make it better. So we need to be mindful of our, our, our choice of language, because look, we have flatlined against underlying growth of age populations. It's flatlined in terms of attendances. We have fewer people over the age of 65 coming to the emergency department. We have, if, an, if they have to go to hospital, it means they don't stay as long in hospital. And they don't stay as long and they don't come back afterwards. Because they stay in their own homes instead of in a rest home. And what it means is if they do come, the average reduction has gone from 71 months down to 28 months. That means there's far less time waiting to get into an age residential care bed. So a lovely example from one is uh, Travis Medical Center. I went out to see them a couple of weeks ago, about six weeks ago now. And they've, um, what you have is nurses working at the top of their license and doctors working at their top of license. And only 90 per thousand, that is world lo class low numbers per GP practice going to the emergency departments. We've got uh, the doctors, the nurses, the practice managers working in triumvirate, showing respect to each other, but also showing a way that you can work as seeing the patient as a partner in their own care. And as I said, more, more nurses, nurses, and nurses seeing more, doctors seeing fewer. And it means everyone, the nurses and doctors can only see what they need to see. So the keys, I'm just speeding up a little bit. Uh, the keys, well, what it's about is this. It's about being customer focused and not being too precious about where we get our learning from. Being flexible about how to reach the goals and investing in education and learning. It pays dividends. It's the old thing about the chief exec who says, or the chief finance officer who says, what will happen if we train all these people and we leave? And the very wise CEO that says, what will happen if we don't and they stay? <laughs> what it means is a health system is in the top 4% of all entities. So what have we learned? Well, it's these sorts of things. It's about valuing patient time as a key metric. It's about a vision. It's about igniting the passion and commitment. It's about the discretionary effort that people want to be able to do. And it's about these sorts of things as well. It's about, many of you were here last year, many of you weren't. So I'm going to talk to you about this very briefly. Because if you're a white Australian man, you can expect now to live to the age of 81. And if you're a white Australian woman, you can expect to live to the age of 84. But if you're a white Australian man who's 78 or an 81 year old woman, what have you got left? What you have is a thousand days. And think about your practices, think about your patients, think about our hospitals, what are they full of? It's about all people in their last thousand days. And I know once you get past 10, life expectancy goes up. The longer we live, the longer we can expect to live. But you know what? What we have is a collective moral purpose not to steal people's time. It's about adding value in the way that matters most. It's also about asking the question, why are nurses at the heart of primary care? And I was thinking about this this morning. And as Dylan, Dylan Gumpert, they had three bits. They said, it's about the emotional connection. It's about the partnership. And it's about the guided discovery on a journey to health and a journey to maintaining and managing one's illness. But I think the other bit that nurses have got is we are bilingual. 
because we speak medical ease and patient ease with ease. We are natural translators. As a fantastic Ethiopian phrase that says, where women rule the world, rivers run uphill. What are our, is our profession? It is 90% female. 96% of, of people who work in general practice, in women, uh, practice nurses, are women. And we can make it better, we can collectively, and it's not about what's fair, what's equal, what's wrong, what's right, what it's about is how do we collectively make an impact for a better society? And nurses can be found on every street. Primary care nurses can be found everywhere. Primary care nurses make an enormous difference because what we do is we combine our head of knowledge, our heart of, of passion, our hands of skills, and our soul that makes the most difference because that's the fire when the, where the passion lies. But ultimately, it's about this. It's about believing in ourselves. <laughs> Thank you so very much. <laughs>